Here's what you need to know if you're thinking of changing your IT provider in 2024. But before we get into the episode, if you're the person responsible for dealing with the IT and cybersecurity in the business, then you've come to the right podcast. Every Wednesday, we upload a new episode packed with information to help you ensure you get the right technology and security in place. So if that's of interest to you, go ahead and hit that follow button in your podcast app. Okay, let's get into today's episode. One of the biggest problems when it comes to IT in your business is sometimes how to choose an IT company. Because people don't know how to buy IT services. This is a problem. I always kind of use analogies and the one that I've used several times discussing this is buying a car. Most people know that they need a car to have four wheels, doors, steering wheel, these kind of things. But there'll be other things that you might look for. You might want to have heated seats. You want to have DAB, a heated windscreen, sunroof, all these things. So you know what you're looking for and you can narrow down the options based on that. And you might have a particular preference for a a brand. But when it comes to IT, most people buy IT by using their gut instinct. You know, if you go out and speak to three IT companies, you'll typically pick the one that you feel like you'll be able to work best with, the one that you like the most. Of course, price is always important, but assuming that price is typically always around the same, there might be 50, 100 pounds a month difference between three or four IT companies, but you tend to find that in your area, the price for IT is pretty much all there or thereabouts. So assuming price isn't a massive contributing factor, you would pretty much just go based on your gut instinct. So because of that, we have developed the IT Services Buyer's Guide, and we've just updated this for 2024. And there'll be a link to how to get the PDF in the show notes. We don't ask you to give any information. You don't have to put your email address in or anything like that. It's just a link direct to the PDF. And you can download that, print that out, whatever. What I recommend is that if you're looking to change your IT provider, that you read this guide and use this to formulate the questions and the criteria that you're going to ask all the different IT companies that you are going to invite in to come and have a chat about moving your IT support to them. The guide includes loads of information and some of the things to give you an idea of what's in there is we talk about IT strategy. So most businesses will do some business plan and some business strategy, but they don't really think about IT strategy. And you get to a certain point and a certain size in your business where IT strategy becomes really important because IT is a great enabler. It gives so many benefits to a business, productivity, efficiency, all these things. But few businesses actually think about how IT lines with their business strategy. We also talk about why business owners and managers and business change IT companies? What are the triggers that would prompt you to switch IT partner? And then we talk about things like what all IT companies wish that you knew about IT, because sometimes there's frustrations on the other side of the table as well. And then we also have a section and a chapter about internal IT. If you have internal IT, how you can get help for those people, because sometimes there's an assumption made that If you have an internal IT resource, that that's all you need. Here's a bit of an insight. Not all IT people know everything about IT. You need a team of people because IT is such a, two letters, but such a huge topic. And especially when you throw in cybersecurity, you're like, we hire one IT person, and then you're assuming that they can provide everything your business needs from an IT point of view. You're going to find that there's areas lacking. And the problem is, is that person won't tell you this. They're not going to come and say, by the way, I don't have all the information I need to be able to do my job properly, right? You're going to have to have a backup for them because they're going to take holidays. They're going to be ill. So there's going to be times of the year where you're left with no IT resources internally because of these things I've just mentioned. So how do you get IT support for your IT? And that's where a co-managed IT environment comes in. So we've got a whole chapter about co-managed IT and why it's a really good idea and why your internal IT person or IT manager will love working with an outsourced co-managed IT company because it means that they will actually be able to get a holiday. 
and not get a phone call when they're just about to get on a plane to say that the printer's not working. Because let me give you a little insight into what it's like to work in IT. Getting a holiday is an absolute nightmare because you panic and worry in the run up to your holiday that you just know something's going to go wrong because IT problems never happen when you're sitting around with nothing to do. IT problems always happen when it's 4.58 on a Friday, when you're just about to get on a, a flight to Tenerife, when you're just about to sit down at your children's nativity play at Christmas, right? IT problems always happen at these times. It's the IT gods hate us. <laughs> and if you have internal IT people, their lives are being affected by these things all the time and you just don't see it. And of course, everyone just leans on them when they need help, regardless of when that is. So outsourcing IT and having co-managed IT is fantastic. You tend to find that this model comes in for slightly larger companies. Typically, once you're getting to around about 100 computers in the network, it's where you might have an internal IT resource. But like I said, don't assume that's all you need. They need tools to do their job, and they also need backup for projects and for when they're not available and for when there's things that are just out with their skill set and their remit. So we do this for a number of businesses and it's a fantastic way of working. The other thing that we talk about in IT Services Buyer's Guide is that what would typically happen during the first 90 days when you move IT company? This is the honeymoon period. This is where things are new. There can be a lot of change happening. So what would typically happen in that first 90 days? This is a really good question to ask IT companies when you're talking to them and you're thinking about switching to them. Ask them that question. What does the first 90 days look like if we were to move to you? What you're wanting to really see is do they have a typical standardized onboarding strategy that they can describe? Yeah, this is what happens in the first three months of us onboarding a new customer. If they don't know what that process looks like, that's a bit of a worry because it might mean that they've either not thought about it in a formal way and that they're just doing it ad hoc and every time's different. It might mean that they don't typically bring on many new customers. They don't really have this fleshed out as an actual process. And what that really means is that they're just going to wing it. They're just going to bring you on board and unfortunately, you're going to feel the pain of them winging it. So you want to make sure that they've got a clear idea of what they're going to do. It might not be absolute specific things like for your business. They might want to say, right, we're going to do this and we're going to do that within your company because at the point of initially talking to them, they don't know that much about your IT. So it's not easy to give specific advice, but they should have a rough idea of what they would typically do for a new customer during the first 90 days. What's the onboarding process look like? Because changing IT companies is perceived as being a pain in the arse. It's like changing your accountant or changing your bank. It's along the same lines. Inertia loyalty is massive when it comes to IT companies and their customers. And that's great for us, but it also works against us when we're looking at growing our business and bringing on new customers because we speak to businesses all the time that say, yeah, our IT company's okay. You know, we've worked with them for years the fact that they bring Krispy Kreme donuts to the office now and again is quite nice. They're okay. But the problem with that is that the perceived pain of switching is greater than just putting up with mediocre service or bad service. And quite often people are tied to a contract, so there's not much they can do about it anyway. But we've had situations where we'll speak to a customer or a potential customer and they'll say, yeah, we're not really happy with our IT company, but we've still got eight months left to run in the contract. And when you get around to speaking to them at the end of the contract, it's like everything's okay again. So the problems they were having in the past have been forgotten about. I quite often describe working with your IT company as a bit like a marriage. You can put up with a lot of shit before someone says, right, enough's enough and we need to call it a day. And um, that's typically how it goes. People will put up with a lot of stuff from the IT company because, again, they don't know what they don't know. And their IT company can say things to get around difficult situations. And the customer just has to believe what they're telling them because if it's very technical, they don't understand. So there's some things that people put up with and there's some things that people definitely shouldn't put up with. Responsiveness. 
speed of response is probably the common issue that we hear a lot, which is, yeah, they're too slow to respond. We've been in situations very recently where people have been describing situations where it's taken five days to get a response to a problem. And I say to them, we'd feel pretty bad if we were taking five hours to get back to you. Never mind five days. And they said, even if we got a response within 24 hours, that would be like amazing compared to what we've got right now. Like I said, the buyer's guide has a ton of questions in it that you can use when you're going out to speak to IT companies. And it's going to help you evaluate the differences between them because we talk about comparing apples with apples. And the problem is if you don't have a guide, something to guide you, if you're not educated on how to buy IT services, what ends up happening is that you'll have a conversation. They will ask you some questions like, how many computers do you have? How many servers do you have? How many people do you have, et cetera? And then they'll just chuck you a proposal and it's going to have computers, servers, other services for support and a price. And effectively, what you're going to do is you're going to look at the prices and then you're going to remember whether you liked those people or not. And you'll probably make a decision based on that. And that's just not the right way to do it. Because what you've not had is an, a, a way to equally evaluate all these IT companies. And ultimately, you don't actually know what it is that you're actually asking for. You just, ah, oh, we need IT support. We're changing IT support company. But what is it you actually want? What is your shopping list? come back to the car analogy, you know, all the things that you want in a car, what are all the things that you want in an IT company? Most people don't know. I ask people this in the sales process when we're having meetings. What is it you're looking for in an IT company? Well, we like someone that doesn't take, you know, a week to respond to things. We like them just to be nice people, friendly. And things like that. And that's all nice. And you can make those decisions yourself, but that ultimately isn't helping you to actually come to any sort of decision. So we've got some questions in the IT services buyer's guide for 2024 that is going to help you get to the bottom of solving this problem. For example, tell me about the specific people that will be looking after us. Who do they have? Do they have an account manager? How do they manage their help desk? Things like that. Can you explain something deeply technical to me? One of the things that I get a lot of feedback on and other people within our team as well at M3 is that we are very, very good at explaining very technical things to our customers in a way that they can understand it. And I probably don't give ourselves enough credit for that, but that's a massive tick. It's a huge skill to have. But of course, when it's something that you just do naturally, you undervalue it, right? Being able to explain these things, the analogies and things like that, so that people can understand it. Quite often after we start working with a new customer, they will say things like, I've never had a conversation about IT like this before. For the first time, I actually feel like I understand what IT does and what IT means in our business because I've never sat with an IT company and then walked away at the end of the conversation going, yeah, I totally understood what the guys were talking about. Usually, they'll say things like, yeah, we meet with an IT company. They talk about a whole lot of technical stuff. They show us a proposal for something with a cost and we're just left feeling like we just have to accept it because we don't actually understand what it is they're actually proposing. We're like, well, they're telling us this is a good idea and we should do this thing and it's going to cost 10 grand. So if they're saying it's a good thing, it must be a good thing, right? But they don't actually understand it. It's really important for me and for our team that our customers are comfortable and understand what it is that we're talking about and that they also understand what we're planning to do or the changes we're planning to make within their systems and any investment that they need to spend because we want the customer to know that it's a good idea. I don't just want the customer to trust us that it's a good idea. I want them to feel like they understand it and they are making the decision that it's a good idea themselves based on what we've said. And that's a really important thing. So like I said, there's loads more in the guide that will help you have these kind of conversations with potential IT partners when you're looking to switch your IT company. So that will do it for this episode. Be sure to check out texspodcast.com, which has over 100 other episodes of content just like this one all aimed at helping you to get the right IT and cybersecurity for your business.